The topics covered in today's webinar are particularly relevant to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grassland ecosystem team and in managing their trust species. But as an ornithologist and bird lover myself, I hope you all appreciate the presentation by our three speakers today on grassland birds and climate change. There will be one shift in how we are going to be conducting the webinar today. Um, unlike our prior webinars, there will be no breakout group and the um, and the full webinar is expected to last an hour and a half. We had been wanting this training series to be as interactive as possible and our earlier um, train, uh, training webinars had had a breakout session, but it wasn't really working as planned. So instead, the interactive component of this webinar will include polls and quite a bit of discussion in the chat. So we encourage you to minimize your email window, minimize all the other distractions, and participate as much as possible by responding to the polls and engaging in the chat. Finally, we would really appreciate your feedback after the webinar. We are gonna be producing a summary report describing this training series early next year. And we wanna make sure that our future trainings are as useful as possible. So I encourage you to fill out an evaluation form um, about today's webinar and any of the prior webinars that you have attended and maybe didn't have a chance to fill out an evaluation for yet. Um, we're gonna be dropping a link to the evaluation form in our chat and, um, and I'll try and get a chance to, to send it again at the end of the webinar. We also have been discussing ideas about creating a community of practice that would continue beyond this training series by sharing participant information and possibly the creation of a listserv. We're very open to any ideas that you might have, so please let us know. Um, we'd be interested to know if, you're, if you'd like to be part of the community of practice or any ideas that you might have about, about manifesting that. And if you do not want your information shared, please make sure to let Emma Custer know and we'll drop her email address into the chat as well. So our three presenters today have all worked closely together, both in their research and also in planning this webinar. Dr. Ben Zuckerberg and Dr. Chris Ribick are both professors in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and both have an extensive research background in climate change and wildlife, specifically grassland birds. Also present, presenting, presenting today is doctoral student J.C. Bernard Plasted, who will share some preliminary results from his work on grassland microclimate and nesting birds. And my apologies for not doing a great job pronouncing his name. Um, we'll be putting their full bios in the chat, so please check that out for more information about our speakers. And without further delay, I introduce Dr. Ben Zuckerberg. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come and present to you all today. Um, and yeah, as Elise was kind of mentioning, we're not going to do breakout rooms, but we are going to try and make this, frankly, as interactive as possible, engaging. And we're not going to get into sort of the minutia of sort of methods or analysis. We're going to kind of sort of broadly talk about some of our recent findings and some of the implications of climate change on grassland birds. So I'm going to switch over to a presenter uh, mode here and, and, and start the presentation. But while I do so, I'm going to have JC put in a prompt into the chat room. Uh, and the idea, this is probably one of the most important initial questions we have, which is effectively going to be, what is your favorite grassland bird? Um, and so uh, while I do that transition over the presentation, go ahead and put your answer into the chat room, start becoming comfortable with sort of giving your responses and answers in the chat because we're going to be using that. Uh, pretty frequently. Okay, so I think everybody should be able to kind of see uh, the presentation here. Uh, maybe a quick thumbs up if that's okay. Um, and um, and so uh, we'll begin here. And actually, I'm going to turn it over first to Chris, who's going to talk uh, and give a discussion and overview about grassland bird populations and frankly, how they're doing over the last 30 to 40 years. Okay, thank you, Ben. So we've known for a long time that grassland birds have been declining faster and more steeply than any other bird guild in North America for a long time. If you read the early naturalist accounts starting in the 
early 1900s, they write about the loss of metal larks in their local areas. But it really wasn't until the breeding bird survey started in 1966 that we've been able to quantify and show the scale and scope of this decline. And I would say that these breeding bird survey maps here for the grassland bird species below are basically worth a thousand words. Next slide. So you may have seen a recent paper in 2019 that reiterated the population loss and the decline of grassland birds. But what they did that was unique was they actually started to put numbers to the number of grassland birds lost. So 720 million birds lost, grassland birds since 1970, three and four metal arcs lost. So these numbers to me are very eye-popping. And you have to remember, this is only the loss since 1970. So the decline of grassland birds has of course led to a focus on grassland bird conservation. But in order to slow or stop the decline, we have to figure out the drivers or causes of the decline. So our first question to you for a chat is when someone asks, why has there been such a decline in grassland birds? What comes to your mind as an explanation? So Chris, just to summarize here, we're seeing a lot on habitat loss, the conversion of grasslands to row crop agriculture, conifer expansion. A lot of people talking about loss and fragmentation, some about contaminants and pesticide use. Okay. Well, okay, we can go to the next slide. Great. Okay. So um, the consensus of a lot of people is, is that the largest driver of grassland bird declines is actually that loss of grassland habitat. And agriculture was likely the initial driver of habitat loss. In fact, if you read some of the writings like by Knopf and Sampson, they wrote in 1997 that the arrival of European descendants on the North American grasslands drastically altered the face of the landscape as well as ecological relationships within the biota. But there are other drivers that have caused more habitat loss um, that have followed and somebody mentioned it, which is of course urbanization, which is a big one. But habitat loss is not the only problem, and some people alluded to that in their chat. There have been issues with habitat quality as well. So here comes our next question to you. How might habitat quality factor into the decline of grassland birds? Or if you don't, or just what are some of the factors that contribute to a decline in habitat quality? Either one will work. So we see uh, invasive species popping up, reduction in nest success, reduction in food quality and food sources, less food. Habitat fragment, fragmentation sort of distinct from loss. So sort of the parcelization of grasslands mm -hmm. and the reduction of core habitat. Woody encroachment, more predators, trees. Right. Okay. Interesting. So a lot of these are. Um, so a lot of the the causes of habitat quality, the tree invasion, there's red cedar, fire suppression is going to impact it. Invasive species people talked about. Um, overgrazing can be a cause of. Um, reduced habitat quality, all leading to things like um, uh, impact on productivity. Um, and there are other factors now coming into the fore. There's additional drivers that are going to impact uh, grassland birds. It may compound some of the problems that you've already identified. And so what we want to do is actually start with some polls. And the first poll is more of a historical question. And the second poll is going to be more of what do you think is important today? So let's bring up poll one. And so just please make a single choice as fast as you can. So this is about 1970, early on. 
lots of responses coming in rapidly. We're at 26 people. So I'll give folks maybe like 10 more seconds, put your response in and then I will end the poll. Yes, you can only pick one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a poll. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end the poll now <laughs> and share the results. Interesting, okay. Um, agriculture intensification, of course, was the number one. And I just wanna point out for people who may not know, the reason why the breeding birds started was actually because of, if you remember what was happening in 1960, was Silent Spring. So it wouldn't have been a miss to have picked pesticides because at that time, that was a huge impact that we had no clue about. So I was it's interesting, thank you. You can close that. And so then we can go to poll number two, which is really about today. So thinking about now, what would you check, pick? And no, it's not a trick question. <laughs> All right, give folks maybe like five more seconds to put your response in. All right, I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. Interesting. So uh, agriculture intensification is continuing and in fact, energy crops are having a big impact as well. Uh, climate change, thank you for picking that. Um, and also again, suburban development, other infrastructure is also continuing. Um, and so it's interesting that pesticides isn't considered current, which is um, because of neonicotinoids. But again, this is, it's really fascinating to see what people are picking. And I'm very happy you picked climate change because now I'm going to turn this over to Ben to actually go on with the rest of the presentation, the workshop. Great, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, set us up pretty well. Uh, um, so I think I'm not gonna belabor some of these broader points or conclusions about climate change in the modern era, uh, um, other than to kind of really capture sort of two main things I'd say is that one, you know, clearly one of the telltale signs of modern climate change is that we've seen a fairly ubiquitous warming throughout the world. Um, and this has resulted in about, you know, the last 40 years, a degree warmer than what we started off in the BBS, you know, in the 1970s or so, in a world that is effectively one degree warmer overall um, in terms of Celsius. That is. Um, one of the more important characteristics of this warming is the fact that it is so uniform compared to other periods of climate change but there really are very few areas throughout the world that are bucking the trend, so to speak. And much of what we've been seeing in terms of that warming is disproportionately high in these northerly latitudes. Um, in fact, when we do kind of even look at reconstructing temperatures, uh, one of the things that clearly stands out to me, especially when we think about how grassland birds and other species are adapting to this, is that this is relatively unprecedented over the last 2,000 years. In particular, that sort of rate of warming that we see here over the last 40 years or so is kind of unmatched when you look at sort of the historic record. And when we start actually looking at reconstructions, this is very well going to be one of the warmest multi-century periods in the last 100,000 years. So clearly for a lot of species, this represents sort of a very new and novel threat in terms of how they can effectively deal with this warming environment and how they can deal with extreme events. And clearly climate change in grasslands, probably more so than in other uh, areas and other habitats, have the sort of concurrent impact of all the other factors that Chris was just describing, and you were all selecting suburban development, agricultural intensification, pesticide use, all this, all these factors are still playing out, but underlying that are these pretty dramatic changes in the Earth's climate system. Um, one of the more important findings also, especially as it relates to climate change in grasslands and birds, is this idea of climate change velocity. So when we think about velocity of climate change, what this really is meant to capture is sort of the 
uh, you can almost think about it as shifting isotherms, sort of how quickly climate change is occurring over geographic space. And so they actually represent this as kilometers of sort of climate change per year. So how quickly this sort of shifts are occurring. And some of the more important findings are that one, clearly you can see with minimum temperatures, some of those redder areas are where you're seeing some of the fastest changes, the fastest velocity, climatic water deficits, sort of these changing conditions also right there in the central part of the US and other parts of the Midwest. And one of the more important findings is that if you look at sort of the rate of climate change here, both in terms of the speed of climate change across sort of different types of biomes, I kind of point out here that some of those rates are fastest. In fact, they are the fastest in temperate grasslands, savannas, shrublands, and in tropical grasslands as well. So my first question to you sort of as a group is why would this be the case? Why might the rate of climate change be faster in grasslands than other biomes? So an old colleague of mine, Chris Latimer, says lack of geodiversity, moderating effects of large water bodies, positive feedback loops, absolutely. Geographic location. Yeah, so good. These are all really good responses. And in fact, does capture a lot of what's going on. Um, and really what it is, is that when you think about sort of this idea of shifting isotherms, you can imagine that there's very little resistance in terms of how climate change can play out across a relatively flat terrain, like where most grasslands do occur. So once they kind of hit elevational gradients, those isotherms have to kind of climb up that elevational gradient. And so when we actually look at very flat, low-lying areas, the sort of lack of sort of buffering effects, a lack of topography, at least compared to, you know, more sort of higher elevation areas, you can imagine that's where you're going to see some of the fastest changes in climate. So what this means then, and in terms of the consequences for grassland birds, is that most assessments suggest that half of grassland birds will face these additional pressures that grasslands will become drier and more exposed to extremes. And this is even concern for what we consider to be or have always considered to be sort of even common species like meadowlarks uh, that are showing some of the more precipitous declines. So I'm gonna kind of put out another poll here to get your input. So poll number three, if we can put that up. So if you had to choose one of the following climate change impacts, would you expect to most negatively impact grassland birds where you where where you work. So which of these sort of uh, factors, warmer, longer growing seasons, more frequent and extreme droughts, maybe more frequent and high intensity storms, maybe changes in plant productivity, changes in that growing season, like up here, increased woody encroachment. So of these different factors, and think about where you're working and where your sort of your management or where your your uh, conservation efforts are being deployed. Which of these are most concerning to you for grass and birds? So I've got several coming in. So we'll give folks maybe another five seconds or so to get your response in. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now Great. and share the results. Yeah, so really interesting here that most people were concerned about these extreme events. So in particular, the idea of extreme drought. So when you do get drought events, when people are thinking about their own issues in their own backyard, um, this idea that extreme dro droughts could have the most sort of disproportional effect on grass and birds. Increased with the encroachment is also there, the sort of another sort of secondary factor. And then other things that people are really less concerned about are this idea of like high intensity storms or rainfall events. And then of course, what I'm seeing here too in the chat is all of the above. So 
I guess the other question here following up on that is, are there other factors beyond climate change that you might be concerned about that may be interacting with climate change? Again, where do you work? urbanization, conversion of natural grasslands. Changes in policy and trade policy. Introduction of cool season grasslands, pesticides, the loss of breeding habitat, invasive species, habitat con uh, conversion, interesting wind turbines. cultural differences, trouble encroachment. Yeah, and the point about this is that um, all these, as we were kind of mentioning, all these factors are still playing out and it's very likely that they will interact or be synergistic with the effect of climate change. So I'm gonna kind of spend some time and think a little bit with you all about this idea of vulnerability. In particular, what makes certain grass and birds more or less vulnerable to the impacts of climate change? Um, and I'm going to kind of talk about this in two different ways. Um, one of them is this idea that some species may be just more or less sensitive to climate and climate variability. So, for example, they could have maybe physiological sensitivities or demographic sensitivities that just happen to make them sort of more sensitive to changes in climate and climate space. The other aspect here, though, is exposure. And the idea here is that climate change is a much is a fairly complex and heterogeneous process. And as a result, not all populations of these birds are going to be exposed to the same amount of climate change. So you can imagine then that the species that we're most concerned about are those the ones that are highly sensitive in terms of some aspect of their life history or their biology to climate variability, and also those populations of those species that are most exposed to those changes and even changes in extreme events. The idea being that these two components then feed into this broader sense of what makes a species more or less vulnerable to climate change. Ultimately, when we talk about management and conservation, then the idea is that we hopefully can identify ways that we can either reduce that sensitivity or reduce that exposure and ultimately then reduce their vulnerability. So I want to take some time actually and think a little bit about sort of broadly how species and birds in fact respond to climate change or some of the sort of the widely sort of touted lines of evidence that species in fact are responding to climate change and how grass and birds may be fitting within those responses. So really actually back in the like the 1990s or so when we first started thinking about how birds and other species will respond to climate change, sort of I'd say the broadest hypothesis was that over time, as we're seeing sort of warming throughout the world, we're going to see species shift in terms of their distributions and their ranges. And then what we generally predicted was that if you're a sort of a cold or uh, winter adapted species, let's say, let's say they're in that blue, then maybe you'd see some sort of change in your range boundary. At the same time, if you were sort of a warm adapted or southerly adapted species, let's say they're in that yellow, you'd also see potentially a change in that range boundary. So over time, what we predicted was that, in fact, we'd see this poleward shift, that suddenly warm adapted species would sort of move northward as you're seeing warming, and sort of these cold adapted species would also be showing this northward or this poleward shift in their range boundaries. Clearly, the real underlying assumption here is that their range boundaries, their distributions, are actually most strongly constrained by climate, and as that climate moves, so will their populations and their range shifts. This idea of a poleward shift is actually one of the most ubiquitous lines of evidence that species are in fact responding to climate change. And various publications and various studies have shown this in various parts of the world that not just birds, but other taxa are in fact showing the systematic shift northward. However, really interesting is that grass and birds as a group tends to be one of the few groups of birds that actually are not showing this shift. They're not showing this sort of requisite whole word shift as we would hypothesize in response to climate change. So my question to all of you is why might this be the case? 
Why are grassland birds the only group not shifting forwards in their ranges? Yeah, so some good responses here so far is that, you know, per potentially what is limiting them, almost like a bookend effect, is the availability of grassland. And I would definitely sort of, I see that, you know, that comment about Lacan Sparrow is that um, when we think about this poleward shift idea, it really is looking across multiple species. So can you find evidence of a given species or a single species maybe moving northward? Absolutely. But systematically across other group, it's really one of those few groups of species that are not showing it quite as fast as other species. So potentially here, what I see in the comments is that, you know, this idea of available habitat is definitely constraining. So some of the work that's been done recently have been trying to sort of tease out what could be happening here as to why this group of species may not necessarily be in lockstep with other species or other groups. And so one aspect here is things like extreme weather and events. And one of the important components that people brought up is drought. And one of the sort of interesting uh, examples of this uh, is work that's been done by Brooke Bateman looking at dick thistles and their population changes in response to a, a fairly large drought event. And so the idea here is that when you have drought events that occur, especially in the core of a species range, well, what, what she found was that the drought actually pushes birds to their range edges. And they kind of do this in sort of a in very different sort of complex ways. It's not just sort of systematic shift northward, that they were kind of just seeking out sort of different, more productive environments along their range edges. And clearly, dixisols, like other species, also have this sort of eruptive capacity. So one of the interesting aspects of this is that what happens when you do get an extreme event like this that's very large in its geography, is that they will sort of show this very sort of quick transition in terms of their population dynamics from one year to the next, and they'll kind of be seeking out potentially more productive sort of refugia that may be now along the range edges. Another important aspect of this, though, is really this idea that, uh, that different components of climate change can have both direct and indirect effects on demographic processes in grass and birds. So one of the more important components of grassland bird ecology is trying to document our nest success. And clearly climate change can have this idea of a direct effect on nest success in terms of the survival of the nest and it's generally reproductive success. So in this case, you can think about direct effects being things like heat mortality or heat, heat waves that might actually influence things like egg viability. You could also imagine that, let's say, during sort of storm intensity or really high storm events, in certain areas, you might get flooding events. And this has definitely been documented for some species. And that could be sort of broadly encapsulated these two ideas or this idea of a direct effect. However, and what is always a little bit more difficult to tease out is this idea of indirect effects. In this case, it's not necessarily climate change per se that's driving it, but other climate-mediated effects like predator behavior. So for example, maybe having warmer temperatures that might influence a search activity of a given predator, like a snake or a small mammal. Maybe there's aspects of their foraging efficiency that maybe during inclement or extreme events that, uh, that they're reducing their foraging efficiency or that's being compromised in some way or another. And there are clearly behavioral trade-offs too that may be at play. Now, these things are not clearly these direct effects but they are being mediated in one form or another by climate change and extreme events. So one of the important findings, uh, and this is work that Chris and I were engaged in a few years ago, was actually trying to look at some of this effect as we've kind of noted this importance of habitat loss as being sort of this other synergistic and maybe interactive effect. 
um, and trying to see how nesting success, like I just documented there, might be influenced by extreme events, and in particular, spring temperatures. And one of the interesting findings we kind of uncovered here, looking at some a meta-analysis, so multiple species and sort of multiple evidence of nesting success, is that extreme temperatures tend to be worse in smaller grasslands. Uh, the effects of those extreme temperatures tend to be worse in smaller grasslands on nesting success. So my question to the group is, why might this be the case? Why might the negative effects of nesting success be worse in smaller grassland patches. Yeah, so some interesting responses here. Uh, the idea that you might have higher rates of nest predation or parasitism, the idea that you could have maybe less heterogeneity in resources. Um, I think we, we even saw things like, you know, potentially just variation in, in micro conditions. Um, and then there is this question of wh why did we see this positive effect here? And so this idea that larger patches might actually, in some cases, sort of allow for a positive effect. And we'll kind of go into that as well. So, but, so interesting here that I think from looking at this is this idea that you can have this median effect of habitat that could be either ameliorating or exacerbating these extreme events. So to kind of get to this idea a little bit more, I'm gonna walk you through one of our case studies um, of a research project focused on Henslow sparrows. Um, and what we really wanted to do was try to tease out this idea of being able to, one, identify the sensitivity of Henslow sparrows to climate variability, and also incorporate some aspect of exposure. So making this, trying to make this as spatially explicit as possible. So we focused on Henslow sparrow because this was kind of a working group where we kind of sat down around a table with a number of managers and, uh, and conservation planners, uh, really throughout the upper Midwest and try to identify a species that we could really dig into here. And so we had a couple of sort of requirements. One, we needed to have a good information on sort of where they are during their winter and their breeding time. We needed good information on terms of their demography that we could be able to parameterize certain models. And we needed kind of at least a good understanding potentially of what could be those, those sensitivities. And so we focused on Henslow sparrow. It's also a species that tends to receive some, a fair amount of management consideration, especially sort of an indicator of grasslands, grassland areas. So one of the first things that we did, and sorry, going back here a little bit, is we wanted to just broadly identify what would be considered sort of their breeding and their wintering range. Then we wanted to identify again, in sort of this idea of a spatially explicit sort of context, where it could be available habitat. And so we really kind of focus on as much as possible contiguous grassland areas. So roughly about 100 or hectares or so, and there's a reason for that from a population perspective. We wanted to try and understand this interaction between habitat and climate change and then make sort of projections into the future, say something about their persistence. So one of the first things we did was develop this conceptual model, which is really, frankly, Kind of tough to do uh, because sometimes you have evidence, sometimes you don't, sometimes it's just peer review or expert driven sort of uh, input. But really, one of the first things we just identified in terms of looking at the literature and getting input was that components like daily temperature, these temperature effects, could have potentially positive and negative effects on breeding. So, warmer conditions might, in fact, increase breeding, and negative conditions can clearly decrease breeding. Uh, heat waves generally we consider to be pretty bad. So overall, we expected to see this sort of nesting success that would be worse during periods of heat waves. Precipitation actually ended up being pretty complex 
that we saw of potentially this idea that precipitation the year before sort of the breeding sort of leading to primary productivity in that grassland area might actually be beneficial for nesting success and breeding success. That we could have overall changes in total precipitation during the course of the year, changes in average precipitation, but again, getting to that sort of extreme event where we're talking about anomalies or climate anomalies, this idea that extreme precipitation would generally be pretty bad. We also wanted to incorporate those overwinter effects. So trying to, again, capture what's going on there overwintering grounds, be able to say something about precipitation that's occurring in the year before, maybe even the winter before, and incorporate that into this nesting success as well. So we parameterized this as best we could with available demographic data. And so we, we really did want to focus primarily on nesting success again here, because this seemed to be one of those more sensitive aspects of that climate sensitivity for Henslow sparrows. We incorporated information on climate that was capturing both this overwintering as well as the breeding ground. And this is really one of the first things we were able to parameterize, was this idea that nest success actually tended to be positively influenced by breeding season precipitation. So during wetter conditions and wetter seasons, they generally had somewhat higher nest success overall. Temperature was a little bit more uncertain. Something of a positive relationship, but you can tell here there's a lot of variability here. So clearly one of the first things coming out of this was that precipitation had a much stronger effect. One of the good things or one of the more um, useful aspects of creating a demographic model that's spatially explicit, that we can then project what we envision to be rates of nest success based just along those climate, climate parameters, but also incorporating that information on habitat, or at least available habitat, broadly speaking. And so we can do this for every year. When you are able to do this, you can incorporate this into a demographic model and say something about the probability of occurrence and persistence for a population over a given time period, given those climate conditions. So this is 2001 to 2011, and we here we've got basically some model, some estimate of persistence. And you can see one of the things right off the bat is that they're right there in sort of the south western part of their range is that area where we expect to see the most highest probabilities of persistence and occurrence. We can also project this into the future. So in this case, under different scenarios, what's the probability a population will persist, at least 20 birds, now 2040 to 2050? And you can see here this hot spot, or what we like to refer to as the macroclimate refugia, right in sort of that southwestern part of their range. So here we've got a pretty good example of a species that is not projected to move northward that you see the contraction of that demographic space that's really being driven by climate sort of to the periphery of that range boundary and really trying to capture this idea that precipitation is a very complex driver, probably more so than temperature. And this also was useful in the sense of being able to capture that sensitivity, that higher nest success during warmer wetter breeding seasons. But what you're seeing here too, is a geographic complexity of both historic and future climate that you're going to see this collapsing of that demographic niche. But at the same time, it's useful being able to identify a region or a macroclimate region or refugia that might be important for their persistence over time. So I also want to kind of show you a little bit more about what we've been able to uncover here, trying to identify some of these climate impacts. And one of the things, one of the more important aspects of this is that trying to look across multiple species that might be sort of occurring in very different climate contexts here. So you can imagine that grass and birds, clearly that might be occupying drier or wetter conditions or colder and warmer conditions may in fact show very different responses to things like extreme events, changes in temperature and changes in precipitation. So I'm going to kind of walk you through some of our preliminary work on this, and then we're going to take a break for about five minutes, let you stretch your legs a little bit, and then we're going to kind of come back and talk about some of the aspects of climate change adaptation and management. So what we did was we systematically reviewed about 858 published articles, and of those kind of captured 192 studies 
I really try to look at the frequency of significant biological effects of aspects of rainfall and temperature on different components of grass and bird demography. So going all the way from nest survival to abundance and occurrence. What I'm gonna kind of show you here is kind of what we call tallying. So not really getting to sort of the, the magnitude of the responses, but whether the positive effect, whether the negative effect, was a neutral or kind of did you see both of those in that study? And I would point out a couple important components here. We also looked at changes in temperature precipitation of what's referring to as sort of long time scales. So again, we're kind of looking at sort of weather here, but is it occurring over sort of multiple months or a very short time period is more like these extreme events that may be occurring in less than a month or even just a couple of weeks. And I'm going to just focus on a couple of metrics, abundance, nesting success, and survival. We're looking at multiple species here. So what did we find? So some of the interesting findings when we talk about rainfall and its effect on grass and bird abundance is that overall, we actually saw quite a variability in the frequency of these statistical relationships. So we found evidence of negative relationships, negative, uh, evidence of neutral, positive, and so forth. But one of the things that really popped out right away was that these more negative effects of rainfall tended to be more common in these wetter regions. The positive effects of rainfall tended to be more likely in drier regions. So that makes a fair amount of sense, right? That the idea that when you see increases in, this, in precipitation, especially on bird abundance, that if you're in a wetter condition, it's gonna be sort of more negative. If you're in drier conditions or drier climates, you're actually gonna see a positive effect. What about this idea of rainfall on something like survival? And we looked at nets, we looked at juveniles, and we looked at adults. And in this case, what we found was not so much sort of this effect of rainfall that might vary all of sort of the way geographically, but in terms of the short-term rainfall effect tended to be much more negative. So when you get like a storm and what, something that we didn't really pick up earlier when we were doing these polls, but storm events, short-term rainfall, extreme short-term rainfall, generally had a very negative effect on survival. But this again, was much more common in these negative areas, in these drier areas. In terms of survival being positively affected, that really only happened when we had long-term rainfall. So generally wetter conditions, generally increasing survival. Drought, ubiquitous, not good. So drought almost always had negative impacts on abundance, and most of these demographic processes, very, if any, evidence of positive effects of drought. Temperature. So again, what we're seeing is these really strong effects of precipitation. But one of the components that we did see with temperature effects is that warming average temperatures generally had positive effects. And this was especially true in these colder environments or colder climates. One thing that we did notice, though, in terms of these positive effects, is that it was really constrained primarily to mean temperature and average temperature. These sort of maximum temperatures there on the right generally were much more negative, especially so when they were especially so when they were over short terms. So these idea of heat waves that kind of come through. So average temperature warming may have a positive effect on some of these species, and that may be especially true in these colder environments or colder climates, whereas maximum temperatures, especially short-term maximum temperature or increase in the maximum temperature, generally negative effects. Okay, why don't we start? And just checking in, just make sure everyone can hear me and see slide okay. Looks good, Ben. All right, thanks, Sean, appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'd like to kind of pivot a little bit. I think in the first sort of half of this, we really wanted to cover this idea of clearly grass and bird declines, the idea that climate change is clearly a, a very real persistent threat for many of these species, that it tends to be occurring faster in low-lying grassland areas, um, that there could be very negative, but very complex components of how species might be sensitive to climate change, and in particular, sort of what populations may be more or less exposed to that change. Um, and so um, over the last several years, though, and certainly a big 
mission of I think all of us on this team has been, okay, what can we do about it? You know, this idea of trying to think about adaptation and climate change adaptation in particular as sort of the adjustment of a system in preparation for a response to climate change. How can we increase hopefully the resilience of these species to a climate change impact or an extreme event? And so what I would like to sort of I sort of conceptualize here a little bit is what are some of the approaches then that we can think about that might be ecosystem based, that might be habitat based, things that we feel very comfortable in terms of potentially managing that can help sort of lead to sustainable management, conservation, and potentially restoration, which is always clearly a big component of grasslands. So I would just like to say here that when we do talk about adaptation actions here in sort of the following section, we really are designing this very intentionally to address climate change impacts and vulnerabilities. So you'll see here that there are potentially going to be aspects of habitat management um, and certainly other adaptation practices that we are already using. But really the focus here is to try and put that lens of climate change on top of sort of existing adaptation strategies and tactics in order to start thinking more purposely about how we can increase the resilience and decrease the vulnerability of grass and birds to populations. Uh, sorry, to climate change. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand it over to JC. Uh, and as Elise uh, mentioned in the beginning, JC is a graduate student is doing fantastic work on grass and birds. And in particular, this idea of what can be done in terms of sort of managing them on the ground, but really with this idea of trying to identify micro refugia that might be persisting within grassland areas. So JC, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to share with you guys a little bit of this work I've been doing with Ben and Chris, uh, modeling microclimate in Wisconsin grasslands. And, uh, you know, over the, the first part of this talk, we've heard Ben talking a lot about, um, you know, the broad phenomena of climate change and some of the impacts that we expect for grassland birds. Um, we've also heard him talk about, um, you know, how there's a non-uniformity to climate change, right? So we have velocity of climate change is different across ecosystems. We have this idea of a macro climate refugia. Um, and that non-uniformity is true at multiple spatial scales, um, but we often don't really consider the thermal environment um, explicitly as an aspect of habitat, particularly at smaller scales, the way we might, the way we might look at something like vegetation structure or cover. Uh, and that's really because um, until really the last decade, we haven't really had access to technology that allows us to do that very easily. Um, but remote sensing has really changed that and kind of opened up um, this idea of microclimates to ecologists. Um, and so I'm going to kind of start uh, at the end and work backwards here. So I kind of just want to illustrate um, what I mean by this. So um, on the left here is just uh, an aerial imagery collected by drone at one of our study sites here in southern Wisconsin. Uh, it's a cool season grassland. Um, and I guess so this is a good time to talk about sort of differences um, in grasslands across across the region. So, you know, out west, we think of cool season grasses as, you know, these problematic invasive species. Um, here in the Midwest, most of our grasslands that are remaining are planted. Some are warm season, some are cool season. Uh, and these cool season sites actually provide good habitat for a lot of species like eastern meadowlark, henslow sparrow, bobolink. Um, but anyway, that's a digression. So, um, you know, this looks like a relatively uniform grassland. Um, and then on the right here is kind of this, this finished microclimate product that we've been working on. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about how we got here. But what this is showing basically is really fine resolution, uh, 50 centimeter resolution anomaly in air temperature. So basically for any given pixel, is it sort of warmer or cooler than the mean conditions? Um, and so really the idea here is that we see that there really is quite a bit of this heterogeneity in this, in this environment um, in an aspect of habitat that maybe we don't often quantify. So, you know, in broad distributional studies, we'll obviously include gridded climate products to look at grassland bird distributions. In demographic studies, we often will use weather station data um, to try to model some of these effects that Ben's been talking about. Um, but we really don't look at it in this way very often. Um, and when we kind of see it visually like this, you know, it's easy to imagine that, you know, grassland birds may actually queue in on these conditions um, the way they might any other habitat queue when they're selecting a nest site, when they're foraging, when they're kind of interacting at fine scales at the surface. Uh, ben, if you could advance the slide. Uh, and so that kind of brings us to this idea of microclimate. Um, so 
what is microclimate actually? We're definitely hearing a lot more of this phrase being used in literature. Um, meteorologists have this kind of precise definition of you know, conditions at the surface at a horizontal scale of less than 100 meters. Um, I think for wildlifers and ecologists, um, we don't necessarily need to get hung up on that sort of exact scale. Really what we wanna know is, you know, what are the climate conditions that species are actually experiencing in their habitats at the scale at which they're selecting habitat and interacting with it? And so I think what exact scale is appropriate can really vary depending on the species you're looking at and the question that you're trying to answer. Um, but one way I like to think about this is, you know, when we're talking about climate change projections, um, when we're using a lot of these grid climate products, um, you know, these are most commonly going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of at a one kilometer grid resolution. Um, you know, they're increasingly it's starting to get smaller, but typically it's something in that neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, when you're thinking about a small bodied organism, so, you know, a one kilometer grid cell is orders of magnitude larger than most terrestrial organisms, but particularly down at the small end of this, um, something like a grassland bird that's going to have, you know, a centimeter body length. Um, you might think that that's a relatively core scale to be looking at habitat effects. So I like to kind of imagine, you know, a hypothetical landscape here. Um, we have diversity of vegetation cover. We have elevational gradients. We have riparian zones. You know, it's sort of idealized. Um, but if you were interested in habitat selection for this kind of small organism, you probably wouldn't want to assume that that whole grid cell is homogenous. Um, and I'm kind of suggesting that that may be the case with climate as well. If we're kind of interested in really understanding how these species interact with climate and what it means for them, um, there could be a lot of information lost there if we kind of just use these larger grid cell macroclimate products. Uh, slide, please. So, yeah, so what actually contributes to this microclimate variation? How does this work? Um, so, I, there's a couple things listed on this slide that I'm going to talk about. Um, but before I go into that, I also just want to make this sort of point about, um, you know, free air temperature versus surface conditions. So, you know, when we check our weather app or when we use weather station data in our nesting success studies, you know, that data is coming from weather stations that are, you know, placed around the country. It's an interpolation from the nearest weather station. And those weather stations are placed um, specifically to avoid being influenced by local influences like vegetation or a unique topographic feature. And they're also always gonna be two to three meters above the ground. Um, and so, you know, that works fine for an organism such as ourselves, a larger body organism. Um, we, you know, walk five or six feet above the surface. Um, we can insulate ourselves from climate in lots of ways. So maybe an extra degree here or there doesn't matter to us. Um, but when we think about a small bodied organism that's living its life at the surface, um, nesting on the ground, foraging on the ground, um, then we might think that a lot of that variation that's happening at the surface could matter. Um, and we know just from a physics perspective that um, a lot of this variation does happen at the surface. Um, for one, simply because the ground absorbs infrared radiation during the day and re-emits it at night. So that creates a lot more variation. And then in addition to that, we have these other factors that can kind of contribute to microclimate variation. So elevation is a really obvious one. Um, we all know how that works. It can get cooler as you move up in elevation. Um, topography independent of elevation uh, can also be really important. So uh, a lot of times a classic example would be the south side of the slope receives more solar radiance or sunshine and the north side receives less. So you get different ecotypes there and that's possibly a microclimate that species can exploit. Um, topography can also affect the drainage of air. So particularly cold air drainage can be important. Uh, cool air is denser and so you can actually get that sinking down there and creating sort of a cool spot in valleys or depressions. So we call that a valley effect. Uh, and then finally, uh, vegetation that's covering the surface obviously plays a role. Um, so, you know, the classic example would be a dense canopy can provide shading and actually create a cooler microenvironment. Um, and we've seen more studies kind of looking at old growth forest and showing that it does create this buffering capacity. Um, but whether it's trees or other forms of vegetation, um, vegetation can also have uh, an evaporative cooling effect as these plants transpire. Um, so that's another way that vegetation can actually influence microclimate, um, as well as affecting wind speed and other things of that nature. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. So um, obviously, grasslands tend to be relatively flat. Um, you know, there's still microtopography, but we're not seeing, you know, 
really mountainous or hilly regions and grasslands for the most part. Um, we don't see really large elevational gradients, uh, and we don't have this complex vertical canopy structure like we do in old growth forests, which is sort of the more classic example of a microclimate. Um, but I showed you that map at the beginning. We, we do see that there is some variation in temperature. And in fact, um, from the coolest to the hottest areas on that map could be a difference of about four degrees. So there is some variation. Um, so now I'm going to throw a poll up to you guys and see um, what you guys think could be contributing to that variation. And those things that you just saw in the poll are some of the main variables that we looked at in our study. So we'll sort of be able to give you a little bit of an answer to this, uh, at least at our sites um, later in this presentation. But um, yeah, let's let's get those results up here whenever we've got a good amount of participation. Yeah, it looks like we're starting to slow down. So maybe another couple seconds, get your last minute thoughts in and then we'll end the poll. And I just saw uh, grass height thrown into the chat. And yeah, that's definitely something that, that could be important. And that is one of the variables that we do look at. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, OK, so pretty, uh, pretty even spread of things, but definitely people saying primary productivity, slope and aspect, uh, vegetation height. So yeah, I think those are pretty reasonable answers. Um, so before we sort of get into what some of those results were, um, ben, if you want to change the slide, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how we actually did this study and what we were wanting to do. And so, um, you know, our objectives were essentially kind of demonstrate that there is substantial variation um, in near surface temperature in grasslands to so find out what kind of microclimates actually exist. Um, we did show that there is some. Um, and then we wanted to know what drives it, you know. Can we understand the factors that contribute to this? Um, and will there be any management implications associated with knowing that? Um, and then ultimately, we also wanted to know, you know, do grassland birds seem to select for certain microclimates and or do they have differential demographic success depending on what conditions they're in? Um, and so to do that, um, we used uh, several grassland sites located in southern Wisconsin. Um, in this part of the country, um, most of our grasslands are planted, as I said, so we had um, cool season sites, and then we also had warm season restorations that sort of resemble tall grass prairie, but are, are still ultimately uh, planted sites. Um, and we distributed I buttons in a grid across those sites, um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with these, but these are climate loggers that can sort of log um, hourly temperature and humidity data, or wh whatever you set it to, um, you can sort of summarize that in various days. So we did that throughout the growing season. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to not just know exactly what the temperature was at a certain point, but we wanted to be able to create this continuous product that we could sample wherever we found a nest and look at sort of the overall variability. And so to do that, we needed to kind of model and interpolate uh, our climate data. And so we used drones to collect spatial data that would sort of give us the environmental predictors um, to be able to do that. So we tried to capture um, a lot of the variables that we just talked about um, in that poll that I shared. So in the next slide here, uh, I'll give you guys a quick look at um, what that kind of looks like. Um, so this is basically for that same site, so all, all the different spatial layers that we collected by drone or derived um, from our UAS data. Um, and so there's some jargon in here, but DTM is just elevation. So that's the digital terrain model. Um, topographic positioning, um, that's sort of a moving window of neighborhood. So basically for each pixel, we're sort of calculating what its relative position is to the pixels around it. Is it a high point or is it a low point? Um, we calculated slope, aspect, and hill shade to try to get at differences in irradiance based on topography. Um, we did look at vegetation height. That's what that canopy height model is. Uh, and we looked at primary productivity, so using NDVI 
And then finally, um, you know, we also wanted to look at distance to wooded edge. Um, so in the Midwest, um, a lot of our grassland units are kind of smaller. Um, a lot of them have wooded edge versus some of the really expansive um, areas out in mixed grass prairie. And so we thought, you know, shading and buffering from those forested edges could maybe spill over into grasslands. So we wanted to model that as well. And let's take a look at what we found. Um, well, actually, before I actually show you those results, I just wanted to draw your attention to something here um, in our raw I button data, which I think kind of illustrates an important point. So um, if you look at this temperature range plot here in the lower left corner, um, basically that's showing just um, the daily range and temperature that these I buttons were logging sitting out there in the grassland during the summer in the green. Um, and the blue line there is a product that's known as Daymet, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but that's basically a, a free air temperature macroclimate uh, type of gridded product that's um, available for the continental United States. Um, and there's historic data associated with it. Um, and it's one of the finest scale products out there um, for that kind of use. So it's really popular with ecologists um, and it's a really useful product um, for a lot of studies. But I think what really stood out to me here is um, just how little of the daily range of variation that's actually occurring at the surface in grasslands is really captured by that product. Uh, and so that suggests to me that, um, you know, it, it may be worth sort of taking a look at this microclimate idea if we want to have the best understanding of, of how climate affects grassland birds and what we can expect with climate change um, and the sort of range of temperatures that they're actually exposed to. So there's kind of some information lost here if we're using um, some of these existing climate products, I guess, is the takeaway. Um, and now let's take a look at our modeling results here. Oh, one too many. There we go. So um, this is um, what we found. So what you're looking at is relative variable importance. Uh, I'm not going to go really deep into the weeds on, on what we did here, but essentially we did a machine learning uh, modeling known as random forest. And one of the outputs that it gives you is this relative variable importance, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's how influential were the different variables in, in correctly classifying and modeling your climate data. Uh, and so what we see here is that uh, NDVI and this topographic positioning index really come out as the dominant uh, explanatory variables here. Uh, and I think those make some intuitive sense. Um, so, you know, NDVI is kind of this widely used measure of primary productivity. And so we might think, okay, areas that are really productive, they're going to have this denser vegetation, possibly taller vegetation. Um, and so there's maybe going to be more evaporative cooling. Maybe there's going to be some shading. And that kind of seems to fit with, you know, when you're walking out in the morning, the dewy morning in your grassland, you walk through the dense clumps, uh, they can be a little bit wetter, they can be a little bit cooler underneath, um, it makes sense. And topographic positioning, also kind of a similar idea. So even though we're not dealing with dramatic topography here, we do have sort of gentle slopes and drainages, we do have dips and rises. Um, and so there's places for cold air to pool. Um, and, you know, I can think about walking out in these sites in the morning and really feeling when I walk down into a valley or a drainage, I can feel the air is colder. So it sort of seems to fit with our observations um, about how this stuff can work. So um, now I guess the question is, you know, we've shown that there is some variation in grassland microclimates. We have some idea of what can cause it in these grasslands. Uh, and I do want to be clear that, you know, the zone of inference is, is sort of limited to Midwestern grasslands here. So, you know, uh, a mixed grass prairie, it, maybe it's very different dynamics, um, very different structure as you move from, from east to west in grasslands. Um, but it's a starting point. Uh, and Ben, if you could advance the slide. So, okay, so we have this variation, we have some idea of what causes it. Um, so, does this matter to grassland birds? That's that's kind of the question we want to know. And uh, I'm just going to tease that because I haven't done that analysis yet. Um, so we just uh, completed our last field season of data collection, and I've been sort of working on producing this product. So that's the next thing that we really want to address. But I think we can speculate here a little bit about you know what the implications of this kind of product could be. So if we do find that grassland birds actually do sort of pay attention to this, maybe they select for certain nest sites, or maybe they just do better or worse depending on the climate they're in, then I think there's some potential implications. So maybe this can be uh, an adaptive management tool for us. Um, so for example, um, you know, maybe we want to consider this in reserve design. Is it worth sort of targeting grasslands that have more complex topography to sort of preserve areas with a high microclimate heterogeneity that could maybe accommodate 
habitat selection for the most species. Um, our climate change projections, I think uh, we could just make those more accurate. Um, if we really know what the realized conditions these birds are experiencing are, maybe we can do a better job of forecasting how long they can hang on in a given grassland and what we might expect. And then um, finally, I think if we really do find that there are certain conditions that are broadly favorable um, for nesting species, uh, maybe we can look at how we can facilitate vegetation management to help create that. Um, and obviously that can be a tall order. There's a lot, a lot of other structural needs you have to consider in grasslands just for maintaining them. Um, so that may be a balancing act in weighing those. Um, but with that, uh, I will just turn it back over to Ben. Um, and uh, I see there's a question here about autocorrelation between NDVI and TPI. Uh, and the, so the two variables are not correlated. I have not looked at spatial autocorrelation yet, and that's kind of on my, on my agenda as I move forward with this. So these are still relatively preliminary results, but good question. Great, yeah, thanks Tracy, that was awesome. And, and we really just wanted to highlight this idea of, you know, what can we do? I mean, I think some of the, the work that we do at sort of broader scales in terms of distribution modeling, you know, it, this idea of identifying macro climate refugia is really important clearly, but at the same time, we wanna be able to provide guidance at this sort of site level phenomenon. And, and that's clearly where management's occurring. And so I think JC's work kind of really does sort of exemplify what we can do with increasing technologies, be able to kind of capture these microclimate differences, which frankly, in some cases are an order of magnitude more than what we expect to see in terms of future climate change. So trying to preserve those areas and trying to think about how those areas may buffer species from climate change impacts or extreme events is clearly an important uh, avenue. So um, I also kind of going to pivot here a little bit um, and kind of talk about with the time that I've got left here, um, some of our research and collaboration with the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. Uh, this is a division and under the sort of the Forest Service. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to show here has been sort of a really nice partnership with Stephen Handler and some other people at NIAX that, um, that really is trying to capture this idea of providing options or strategies to managers who are thinking about, uh, in a way they've thought about it, really managing forests, but now, now that we're going to beginning to shift to how we can actually manage grasslands. So this really hinges on this idea of an adaptation workbook, okay? And so the idea that NIAX really proposed roughly about 10 years ago is that trying to basically give managers a menu of different climate change adaptation strategies and actions that they can effectively look at and be able to potentially choose sort of what may actually work in their particular system and also be able to say, think about then how that may serve achieving some sort of broader adaptation strategy over the long term. So when we think about this idea, and I know we've seen this, all of us have seen this sort of, you know, great sort of workbook or adaptation or adaptive management cycle where we define our objectives, we assess these climate impacts, we evaluate our objectives, you know, where does the workbook fit in? And I think it's really kind of in this idea of this space of being able to provide this menu of being able to identify specific adaptation approaches to help us sort of be able to achieve our management objectives. So it really is this idea of a menu where we're not really being prescriptive in saying what managers should do. What we are trying to say is, all right, let's think about the actions that we're already implementing or potentially that, that we're not implementing, but can be implemented and think about this within sort of a tiered hierarchy of what we're actually trying to do in terms of an action on the ground and how that might achieve some broader objective. So an important aspect of this hierarchy is this sort of broader concept of adaptation, but you can think about it as becoming sort of increasingly actionable. So, so it's broader strategies of climate change that might be focusing on sort of this idea of resilience or resistance or transition, then really kind of getting even finer in terms of what approaches exist to do that, and then the tactics, the real actions on the ground. So how do we go about doing this? Well, there are a number of these adaptation menus. Some of them have actually been published. And I totally encourage you to go out and check out NIAC's website. You can see it there on the bottom. They've got already published menus for our culture and urban forestry and forested watersheds. It's a really great sort of set of, um, of resources out there. 
And we are right now developing one for grasslands and open coastal ecosystems. Um, what I would say in terms of the overall process, it, it's kind of the same for everything, where we do this sort of literature review. We kind of collect information. We've published a, a fair amount of this for wildlife uh, populations. Uh, we try to sort of bin these strategies and actions that's kind of out there a little bit. And then we actually go out there and do workshops. And a big part of this is sitting down with managers that are actually in the field doing this stuff and saying, all right, what are we missing? You know, what are the, the strategies and actions that we've identified through literature? Is this even applicable? Like, okay, you know, protected areas, is that something that you do? Is that something that you find useful? Is, you know, developing corridors, that's a broad strategy that's oftentimes promoted in the literature, is that something that's within your, your purview? And so getting managers involved through workshops that we've really done throughout the upper Midwest and NIACS is really spearheaded, um, it's definitely been a big part of this. So again, you know, to try and capture this idea of what would be sort of a broader goal, maybe something like resistance. So in the grassland systems, how can we basically forestall change? We know climate change is gonna impact that system. How can we build up that resistance? Then we might be thinking about a strategy might be sustained fundamental ecological functions. An approach may be maintaining or restoring hydrology. And then again, the tactics may be something very specific in this case, install water control structures at road crossing to maintain peatland water levels. So that's something that has taken from their forest uh, management or forest menu. Um, but clearly you can see that it's getting more and more detailed. So I'm gonna kind of offer here a little bit then uh, thanks, John, for posting that, um, is this idea of what we've already started having a draft of. And what I'd love to kind of do is just take a minute or two here and kind of get your input, looking at these strategies in the menu, and then think about taking what is sort of a very broad one, let's say reduce the impact of physical and biological stressors on grasslands. So clearly that's a sort of a big, glorious strategy. What would be an action that you would actually implement? or one of your colleagues would implement that would kind of achieve that strategy. So just kind of take a minute here, if you could put in the chat in your region, what type of action might be used to reduce the impact of physical and biological stressors on grasslands? So I'm saying invasive species control, um, maintaining large core areas, um, grazing management, um, integrated pest management, education, sure, why not? Rewilding, continued tree removal, control burns, regional grazing plans, Yeah, so, you know, just seeing some of this, you can see the diversity of different approaches. Um, and what I would say is that part of what some of these menus do and these workshops do is allow these kind of communications or dialogues to happen. So, for example, when we've promoted or thought about this, you know, in terms of this idea of what could be some of those physical and biological stressors on grasslands to sort of in these workshops, you know, these are some of the different components that come up. So for example, to reduce the impacts from extreme rainfall or drought, well, maybe a tactic would be to restore wetlands within grassland areas to help store and release water from intense rain events. Maybe another tactic may be reduce stocking levels like we've already seen here, you know, or grazing duration during drought periods. 
Um, and so the idea that I think we're trying to promote and as we're kind of moving forward here is that I don't think oftentimes during these dialogues and what we talk about, uh, you know, with managers in these different sessions, we're not introducing necessarily anything totally new or novel. We're also taking what they are doing on the ground as an action and being able to put that within this hierarchy to say, if we're thinking about climate change adaptation and a strategy for adaptation, these are a list of actions that one could consider. And so it's been proven to be, you know, something that a lot of sort of different groups have found pretty useful and we're hoping to continue to spearhead and move forward with NIACS on this. Just kind of look at the clock here. I'm going to kind of go through this last one, but just let you know that, yes, this is, this is an ongoing effort and we're definitely going to be promoting this and kind of putting it out on the website. So look, I'll just kind of hit home on a couple of big sort of, um, I'd say ending sort of messages here. There's no doubt in our minds that grassland birds are in peril. You know, I think most of the broader assessments, you know, in terms of bird populations throughout North America continue to highlight the idea that population declines are rampant for most grass and bird species. Um, and they are clearly sort of within this anthropogenic cocktail of climate change, habitat loss, pesticide use, and they really clearly are on the forefront of some of those threats. I don't think there's much to disagree in the sense that climate change will only exacerbate those threats, but it is complicated. And in some cases, these changes in climate, like what we see with changes in average temperatures or maybe overall changes in rainfall, can actually benefit some populations in terms of where they are in their broader climate context. These extreme events, generally, though, what we've been finding is that the short-term anomalies in climate, which can actually be oftentimes difficult to identify, can actually be also a very true and persistent threat. And most of the broader meta-analyses, and we're not saying that individual species won't show their own idiosyncratic responses, but broadly speaking, these extreme anomalies tend to be detrimental. And so ultimately, though, I think part of what we're trying to advocate here is that grassland management, conservation has been going on for a while. Clearly, it's one of the more managed natural systems out there. we got to think about preservation, conservation, think about reducing things like shrubland and encroachment, pesticide use, as well as agricultural intensification. But all of this, I think we need to start putting that climate lens on those management implications and those management strategies, especially given what we're seeing in terms of future projections. And with that, um, I'm going to stop and hand it over to Elise to kind of, I think, make some closing remarks. Thank you so much, Ben, and everyone, uh, all of our speakers today. And thank you all for participating in, in our chat as well. I know that I honestly am, have like lots of questions from the talk, <laughs> which I know we don't have time for today, but but I might have to <laughs> send you a couple emails. Um, and and if you feel like you're open to that, uh, if you if any of the presenters would like to drop their email address into the chat, that would be awesome. Um, and and then as I as I mentioned earlier, I'd really appreciate it if you um, if all of their, our participants could take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation form for the webinar. Um, and and the final part of this of this series will be an in person workshop. We're just starting to plan that. We don't have dates selected yet. Our priority audience for that workshop is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Grassland Ecosystem Team. But we do expect that the topics covered will be of interest to many, and there should be some limited spaces available. So um, definitely look for an email from us about the in-person workshop. And, and as I mentioned, yeah, we are not yet certain about the dates, um, but anticipate it being sometime this winter. So with that, thank you so much to everyone. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>